Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Ventura. We are a learning, growing, nature exploring, ever changing, and spirit seeking community of resistance, resilience, and resilience. And it is so good to be here with all of you this morning. Our minister, the Reverend Dana Warsnop, is away today. I am Worship Associate Celia Ortenberg, and I am joined today by Worship Associate Sue Brinkmeyer and a whole team of folks who have collaborated to bring the service into being, including Carlos Benavides, Gudrun Eastham, Neil Ortenberg, Mike Sixby, and Kitty Merrill, as we consider everyday spiritual practices. Let us arrive fully together, take a breath, and feel the blessing it is to be here now. Let us enter sacred space. Good morning. I'm Worship Associate Sue Brinkmeyer. It is a spiritual practice for many of us at home to light a chalice as we greet the day or as we sit down to a meal with family and friends. And at worship, we begin each service by lighting our chalice here in the sanctuary. Perhaps those of you at home who are Zooming or YouTubing in with us will light a chalice at home as Celia lights the chalice, symbol of our free faith, here. We open our service with these words from Catherine Callahan called, Let the Chalice Connect Us. As the chalice is lit, let us come together into the sacred space we have created. Let the cares of the day fall away and know that here is a place for quiet reflection, for a pause in our lives, for breathing into our true selves. Let what is said and felt here add richness to the dimensions of our lives and spiritual practices. We are strong together in community. We share the experience of being human. Let the warmth of the chalice lit during our time together connect us and then let, us carry, let it carry us into the world. Come, let us worship together. Good morning and welcome. I'm Carolyn Bierke, the music director, and I'd like to welcome you all here in the sanctuary and online. Please join me in our opening hymn, We Give Thanks, and rise in body or spirit.
And it is a wonderful day today, isn't it? Recently, our Reverend Dana has been talking about spiritual practices. Last February, she spoke about becoming a practicing congregation when she encouraged us all to find our own spiritual practice. Whoops. I can work this. <laughs> A spiritual practice is a disciplined practice that helps us come alive, that gives us the strength to be vulnerable, and helps us be more authentic and open human beings. Last month, Dana's service Blessings, she spoke of one of her own spiritual practices, counting blessings and replacing negative thoughts with positive. Oddly enough, she came to this through her game of tennis, where she was able to recognize her negativity and change the way she saw and reacted to the world, opening up not only to loving herself more, but to having a better understanding of how to live fully. Interesting. Does this make tennis a spiritual practice? Maybe. I suppose it might have to do with how you practice it. So what is a spiritual practice? Scott W. Alexander, in his book, Everyday Spiritual Practices, defines it as an activity or an attitude in which you can regularly and intentionally engage, which significantly deepens the quality of your relationship with the miracle of life both within and beyond you. When asked what makes a spiritual practice different from a hobby, his answer was intentionality, regularity, and depth. Thich Nhat Hanh, a Buddhist monk, points out that washing the dishes can be a spiritual practice. It depends on how you approach it and how it helps you approach your life. Today, we will listen to a few members of our congregation reflect on some of their own spiritual practices. These may be done in solitude, or they may be engaged with others. They may be traditional, or something you never considered a spiritual practice. Yet they have changed, changed lives and opened the hearts of those engaged. I hope that listening to this morning will help you consider a way to connect to whatever name you use to describe that something more that is beyond yourself, that is beyond yourself. And this will help you become actively engaged with the breadth of your experiences of the world around you. And we have Carlos Benavides. Thank you, Celia. Thank you, everybody here today. Uh, my name is Carlos Benavides. I'll adjust the microphone here. Uh, my name is Carlos Benavides, and I'm a relatively new member of this uh, wonderful uh, UUCV here in, in Ventura. Um, and um, I'm very happy for the opportunity to be speaking here today. Uh, but before I begin, I would like to share that my wife Rona and daughter Yancy Elena are here today as well as her mother, um, Helen. She's from the Philippines, and uh, this is her first experience with the Unitarian Universalist Church. So I just wanted to give her a warm welcome, and thank you for coming today. <clears throat> okay, so um, I was asked by Celia um, not too long ago um, if I might like to speak to the congregation uh, about a, a daily spiritual practice um, my daily spiritual practice and how surfing has become a part of that. Feeling honored by the question, I quickly determined that yes, I would like to speak. So I happily accepted and here I am. 
As I started to write down ideas of what I would say, I had a flood of things come to mind, way too many though. I realized I could probably write an entire book on this subject. So I had to come up with a way to keep it a little brief. Believe me, I would love to try and describe in great detail the extreme challenges, the euphoria a surfer experiences when catching 25 foot waves, of being able to harness the power of the mighty ocean. But that might take a little more time than I have here today. So while debating in my mind about what I would say, I decided that the best thing to do would be follow what I had recently read in a Zen Buddhism book, which was to just focus on the basics, to go back to the original essence of the practice. There really are so many layers to both of these subjects. Spirituality and surfing go incredibly deep. And over time, I've noticed that spirituality and surfing have many things in common. I feel so fortunate to be able to say that the combination of these two is very much a part of who I am. It might not be so obvious just by looking at me, but I am a very spiritual person. I've always had a universal respect for all religions and spiritual philosophies with personal experience in Christianity and then Eastern Dharmic religions. Most recently, I have enjoyed immersing myself into a study of the ancient Vedas, scriptures of India. This refined spirituality that I have developed for myself seems to blend quite well with the very intimate and deep connection I have to nature and especially the ocean. In the book on Zen Buddhism, I read the author repeats that the practice need not be very complicated with an ideal or fixed attachment to any certain outcome. That simply sitting in meditation with the correct posture in the moment and focused on the breath were the only things really needed for this practice and actually the most important. Likewise, in surfing, one can't really go into any session with a fixed expectation of wave quality because that can change at any moment with fluctuations in wind, tide, or swell. So instead of ending up disappointed by not having an idealized experience, I've learned that it's always best to go surfing for the most basic reasons. To be immersed in the beautiful ocean, bathed by the cool salt water, catching waves, whatever quality they may or may not have, preferably with friends, other friendly surfers, or even sometimes all alone. So my regular daily practice of spirituality on dry land has been very simple. It has been to just be friendly to as many people as I can throughout the day. I make a conscious effort to be polite, engaged, and finding common ground with my fellow human beings as best I can. It's not very hard. And more than nine times out of 10, it's a very positive experience. These days, my favorite place to do this has become in the ocean while surfing. In a sometimes very competitive sport where the supply of waves and high demand of the many eager surfers to ride each wave very often creates a greedy and cutthroat environment. It seems to be counter to the basic reasons we as surfers engage in this sport, this way of life, as if we've all forgotten why we started in the first place. At the highest point in my surfing life, I was that greedy surfer, always in need of at least 20 or 30 waves to even be content with a surf session. I didn't care if the less experienced surfers around me only got a couple of small waves because the other more experienced surfers and I were getting all the bigger, better ones. That was the point in my life when I enjoyed surfing the least. <clears throat> At a certain point, I had a change of heart and my attitude shifted to be content with just catching one wave and to simply enjoy being in the moment with the correct posture and only focused on the enjoyment of being in pure nature. I started smiling more, greeting others, being friendly to all types of surfers and complimenting them on good rides I saw them have. I even started doing something which about is, is about as rare as seeing pink dolphins. I began giving waves away to other surfers that I was in position for. So I have returned to the basics, to the original essence, and I've never enjoyed surfing as much as I do today. 
So my favorite spiritual practice are to connect with people, nature, and with spirit. And because I've been able to combine my daily spiritual and surfing practices, I can now do all three at the same time. And for that, I will always be grateful. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Carlos. I enjoyed that. For many of us in this congregation, it is a spiritual practice to volunteer our time, perhaps to provide a meal to our homeless neighbors, turn a vacant apartment into a home for someone moving out of homelessness, help an immigrant apply for legal status, clean up our rivers or coastlines, or wear our Standing on the Side of Love t-shirts to rallies to affirm our UU principles. And for 12 years now, it has been a spiritual practice for this congregation to act with great intentionality in taking up an offering at each service for the benefit of an organization working to make the world a better place, a world with greater sustainability equity, justice, and compassion. Each organization has been nominated and voted on by the congregation. Today, our offering goes to our own Lift Up Your Voice to End Homelessness Family to Family Ministry to provide a generous lunch and other necessities once each month to more than 100 of our homeless neighbors here in Ventura. Volunteers from this church, as well as from our sister church, the Center for Spiritual Le Living, show up the first Monday of every month with all the supplies and love needed for lunch. They also bring gently used shoes, clothing, backpacks, sleeping bags, and new socks and toiletries. Our homeless neighbors, some of whom have not eaten since in more than a day, begin to arrive at 10 a.m. and wait until we open the doors at 11. They go through the items we have laid out for them to take away, chat with us as they pick up their lunch, and then many hang out and break bread together. They are always so grateful for the food and other gifts. It is a shame so many continue to be in need of this service, but it is a blessing that offerings like this one today make it all possible. Thank you for giving generously, as you always do.
Thank you so much, Carolyn. I have no doubt that making music is a spiritual practice for you. Yes, I could hear it. We are grateful for the generosity of this congregation. Your generous spirit is a bright and strong thread that runs throughout this community, knitting us together in a beautiful tapestry of love. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Gudrun Eastham, here today to share comments about how covenant groups impact my spiritual life. It's a Monday, and covenant group begins at 2 p.m. in Ventura with folks that I've met with for seven years now. Imagine seven years with the same group or similar group. And my excitement is palpable. This isn't an ordinary discussion group, nor is it a consciousness-raising group, although occasionally my consciousness will be raised. Nor is it an encounter group, or the brutal est training that I experienced in the mid-80s. Quite the contrary. Covenant groups are organized in such a way that two trained facilitators lead us on a particular topic. For example, faith, healing, wisdom, resilience, belonging, creativity, opening to joy, or some topics like cultivating relationships, integrity, and awe. We read from quotes from personalities and world leaders, and ultimately there will be finely crafted questions that the group will begin to answer, or not, because silence occasionally is encouraged. A typical question might be, what do you know about the topic that you didn't know in your younger years? Or perhaps, what did your hardest moment teach you about yourself? A chalice is lit, check-in begins, and I start to settle in for the next two hours, two times a month, for eight months. Yes, it's quite a commitment. And that's what I have no hesitancy whatsoever about. I show up. Technology is new for this girl. <laughs> Sometimes I don't have an answer to a question until I'm sitting in the room. Often, though, I share from my life experiences, born in Czechoslovakia, raised by an only child as an only child, and living in a military family in America. And here's where the rewards and joys of being in a covenant group start to materialize. I'm in complete awe that others are listening to me without critique, without interruption, nor argument or debate. And I've learned, quite frankly, deeply, to begin listening deeply to the others in the group, something that I perhaps haven't begun doing until 10 or 12 years ago. I have never heard, where did you get such an idea like that, Gudrun? <laughs> Nor will I ever hear, well, about that. Here's what you should do, Gudrun. We promise to respect each other and our diverse points of view and our experiences. We promise to listen to each other with open hearts and open minds. We promise to trust each other. And I am deeply enriched by all these promises. We also promise to practice anonymity and ultimately support one another. So, 
after many meetings under these circumstances that I've just told you about, I've often wondered, how can the next meeting that I attend outside the covenant group incorporate some of these practices? What a meeting that would be, don't you think? When I find one, I'll let you know. <laughs> Thank you for listening to me today. Thank you, Gudrun. Taking time to share with one another in covenant groups, in women's and men's groups, in coffee hour, and during the service, the joys and sorrows, we share those that grace our lives. That's another spiritual practice that links us ever more tightly to one another. I invite you now to speak into the gathered silence or write in the chat the names of those you wish to bring into the embrace of this loving community. I hope you'll feel free to keep writing in the chat at home even after the period of silence has ended. Celia will now drop one final stone for all the joys and sorrows yet unspoken in the silent sanctuary of our hearts. May we be truly grateful for all that is our life. Please remain seated while we sing Return Again. Good morning, everyone. My name is Neil Ortenberg, and my spiritual practices have been influenced by three traditions. I was born Jewish since my mother was Jewish. That's the Jewish tradition. If your mother is Jewish, you're Jewish. Um, and I lost track of my words here. <laughs> And that experience of being born Jew Jewish has given me a feeling of a connection with the bib biblical traditions. I have been an active member of this church, doing my best to live the seven Unitarian Universalist principles for over 30 years. And I have been studying and practicing the teachings of the Buddha in the tradition of Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh for about 20 years, with the support and I've been doing that practice with the support of the Buddhist practice group, Friendship Sangha of the Heart, which is an adult program of this church. With these three spiritual traditions in my life, you might call me a Unitarian Universalist Jewish Buddhist, or for short, a UU Jubu. <laughs> that is actually an expression among us who have that background. Yu Yu Jubu. 
As part of my Buddhist practice, I took part in a ceremony in 2004 at Deer Park Monastery in Escondido. In that ceremony, I was committing to the study and practice of the five mindfulness trainings in the tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh. And I was given the Buddhist name, Profound Patience of the Heart, a name which I can only aspire to. I work at that. Of these influences, I focus mainly on two spiritual practices, mindfulness and silent sitting meditation. Mindfulness is the practice of being fully present, not letting thoughts of the past or the future distract you from what is happening in this moment. Being fully aware and present with all the changing sensations of sight, sound, taste, smell, touch, emotions in each moment. In his book, The Miracle of Mindfulness, an introduction to the practice of meditation, Thich Nhat Hanh gives the example of mindfully washing the dishes. He writes, If while washing the dishes we think only of the cup of tea that awaits us, thus hurrying to get the dishes out of the way as if they were a nuisance, then we are not washing the dishes to be washing the dishes. What's more, we are not alive during the time we are washing the dishes. In fact, we are completely incapable of realizing the miracle of life while standing at the sink. If we can't wash the dishes, the chances are we won't be able to drink the tea either. While drinking the cup of tea, we will only be thinking of other things, barely aware of the cup in our hands. Thus, we are sucked away into the future or the past, and we are incapable of actually living a minute, even a minute of our life. That's mindfulness, living mindfully. Now, silent sitting meditation is the practice of sitting still and quiet in both mind and body. There are times when practicing silent sitting meditation that I get more deeply in touch of what Thich Nhat Hanh calls the interbeing of nature of exist, an interbeing of the nature of existence and what the UU Seventh Principle calls the interconnected web of all existence of which we are a part. Silent meditation also teaches me how to be more mindful as I go about my everyday life. <coughs> Excuse me. While I practice sitting meditation, my intention is to quiet the mind-body, being aware of the oneness of mind and body, I usually sit on a meditation cushion with my legs crossed and my hands in my lap, but sometimes I sit in a chair with my feet flat on the surface below me. I bring my attention to my breathing, focusing on the sensation in my nostrils of the cool air in passing from uh, into my lungs and the warm air passing out of my lungs. Or I focus on the sensation of the expansion and contraction of my abdomen as I breathe in and out. I call those sensations my home base. When my attention wanders away from my home base to other sensations like an itch in my cheek or sounds like the sound of a siren or of a fire engine passing by or to thoughts about the future like a project I want to complete later that day or some movie I had seen the day before. Or Perhaps I'm attracted to restlessness in my body. My intention, as soon as I notice those other sensations, thoughts or feelings or sounds, is to observe them for a moment, acknowledging their presence, and then bring my attention back to my home base, the feeling of my breath in my nostrils or the feeling of the movement of my abdomen. I would like to say that I practice mindfulness and silent sitting meditation every single day and every moment of the day. 
But even after 20 years of this practice, I am not consistent with, this, with the spiritual practices I've described. But I keep coming back to them. And I believe that as often as I practice them, they bring me closer to being fully alive in my life. And perhaps coming a little closer to the name I was given, profound patience of the heart. <laughs> and now I'd like to offer you an opportunity for practicing sitting silent meditation. I invite you sitting in your chair to bring your spine extended upward and your shoulders back and down, your feet flat on the floor, and your hands resting on your thighs. Select a home base, perhaps the feeling of your breath in your nostrils or the movement of your abdomen. Or it might be that you choose another sensation in your body or a sound you hear in the sanctuary. Now close your eyes and take in one deep breath and then exhaling slowly, allowing your facial muscles and your shoulders to relax. Bring your attention to your home base and breathe naturally. If you notice your attention has wandered from your home base, acknowledge that and come back to your home base. Open your eyes when you're ready and bring yourself back to the presence of this room.
still young enough to set this. Good morning. I'm not a techie. <laughs> Thank you, Celia, for inviting me this morning. My name is Michael Sixby. Walking is spiritual for me and more. It is adventure. It is exercise, it can be very social, it can be full of wonderful surprises, it is peaceful. For me, walking is a full body experience, mind, soul, body, heart, and spirit from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And feet lead where the spirit, your spirit yearns to go, burdened with body and baggage, <clears throat> Heedless of blister and pain, clad in leather, vibram, and laces towards holy wilderness. I'm going to relate to you four vivid memories I have of experiences on the trail. Thirty years ago, my friend Edmund and I stand on a small rise deep in what is now Sespe Wilderness. This is the first day of a wet five-day adventure. Fog is thick and heavy, rain is intermittent, the air is absolutely still, thick and dense. The pungent aroma of sage and freshly wet dirt is everywhere. A storm is coming. We feel it. It is utterly quiet, absolutely quiet. It is muffled. There is magic about. Something is about to happen. Suddenly, breathtakingly close, a mountain lion hops onto the trail and lopes along directly ahead of us. He doesn't know we are close behind. He doesn't know, he doesn't see us, he doesn't hear us, he doesn't smell us. Viscerally, I suck in my breath. I hold it. He is huge and muscled and graceful and frightening, a full-grown male pushing eight feet, tip of the tail to his nose. He looks my size, my weight. He is perfectly groomed. We watch him, probably a full eternal minute. Seems like hours. Suddenly, he knows we are here and casually bounds off trail and disappears. Uneasily, we wondered, where did he go? Is he in front of us or behind? Is he hungry? <laughs> Will he follow us? I want to touch him. Crazy. He is magnificent and wonderful. He is the only lion I've ever seen in the wild. Fifteen years ago, I'm with a group of Boy Scouts. We are walking in the evening towards punch bowls north of Thomas Aquinas College. This is one of our favorite places. We love the swimming hole, the slide, and the rope swing. We hear a rustling sound on the steep leaf-strewn hill adjacent to the trail, a tumbling, white-striped critter the size of a house cat comes slippity-slidey off the hill. Delightfully, she has closely followed by her pint-sized, black-striped, absolutely darling kittens. She seems surprised to have lost her balance and even more surprised to see Mr. Sixby <laughs> with his group of rambunctious 11-year-olds. Quickly, we realize these are not house cats, but pole cats. Daintily, she grains her footing, spins quickly, and waves hello with her tail. Immediately, all seven kittens do exactly the same. <laughs> Fortunately, it is only a friendly warning, a teachable moment for Mama Skunk and for me. The skunks scurry in one direction. We take the other. <laughs> it is a June evening in 2002. We camp on Topa Topa, out that way, 
far above Ventura during the wolf fire, I watched the yellow sun turn auburn as it falls through the smoke of the angry sky. Evening light becomes a warm amber. An evil sunset forms blocked by noxious cloud. The fire of the sun and the fire of the earth merge. It is as if the sun remains on the dirty horizon. Heaven darkens. From a center of deep red, the skyline becomes streaked in shades of vermilion, mustard, and mud. Crisscrossing contrails divide the dome above. Stars shine. The brown moon whitens and lightens our lofty camp. I watch. God's eternal lights are above. Home and tomorrow and the fire twinkle below. In the morning, there are no lights, only a mist of ash, a sun trying to rise, and a red glow to the west, spewing a vast purple plume. The Oxnard Plain is awakening beneath a strained cotton marine layer, as if a dirty quilt is pulled up over all and tucked in tight against the mountains. I am alone in the Ventura River Preserve, it rains. There are no shadows, only a diffuse warm light. I look out on the countryside and see a rainbow of lush bright greens. Olive, jade, lime, avocado, sage, emerald, chartreuse, cyan. All sprinkled with highlights of orange, blue, brown, black, white, and gold. The world shrinks and is soft and muffled. The sky moves in close. Dust is patted down and splashed away. Everything is clean. Little rivulets form everywhere and feed puddles and ponds, streams, waterfalls, grubs, roots, aquifer, and reservoir. The parched land comes to life. Moss on rocks and trees is soft and alive. Wispy magical mist drift through hill and valley. Peaks appear and disappear in the haze. I open my umbrella and listen to the rain sing. <laughs> Thank you. That was beautiful. I love those images. So another um, spiritual practice without um, much doubt, is music. It means a lot to me, but it can come in so many forms. Musical spiritual practice can come in humming, in listening, in singing, in creating. And also music can sometimes be a form of prayer. The song today is I Am Light. Feel free to let this music be whatever you need it to be. You can hum, you can sing along, you can put your hand to your heart or sway, or you can just listen. Things that cause me pain 
I am not the pieces of the dream I left behind. I am light. I am light. I am light. I am light. the colors of my eyes. I am not the skin on the outside. I am not my age. I am not my race, my soul inside is all light. All light. Defined. I am the God on the inside. I am a star, a piece of it all. I am light. I am light. That was wonderful, Carolyn. Thanks, Kitty. I'm Kitty Merrill, and recycling as a spiritual practice sounds a little precious. <laughs> but what I'm trying to do is consider how my actions affect the earth and its ability to sustain life and revise my actions as necessary. So it's not just recycling, it's the whole process. Where does it come from? What is it? Where is it going? Pre-cycling, choosing what not to buy, is probably the most important. It has become part of my daily practice. I'm in the grocery store with a different kind of walking meditation. I'm looking for salad dressing. I see the glass bottles that can be made again, next to the plastic ones with their questionable recyclability. I survey the ingredients. Are they organic or made with the use of pesticides that endanger the health of the farm workers that produce and damage the earth, and I see my family and me. Will we use it, or is it a whim that will end up at the back of the fridge? I'm looking at you, Trader Joe's. <laughs> Truffle barbecue sauce? <sighs> or remember purple ketchup? Mm, that was a momentary must-have in our house. <sighs> and. How much does it cost, dollars and cents? If it feels like too much, am I better off remembering I could mix up a few ingredients in, in a jar at home? And it would cost the earth a little less, and me too. All this does slow me down in the market. And depending what kind of week it is, the calculations vary. I'm still weaning myself off some favorites. I have a bagged lettuce habit. There's a regular internal dialogue I have revolving around whether eating a compromised salad from bagged lettuce for lunch is better for me and the earth than having an equally fast quesadilla, plastic tortilla bag, but it's recyclable, reusable, 
cheese is an animal product, heating it on the range uses natural gas, etc., etc. So it's not just recycling, it's the whole process. Where does it come from? What is it? Where is it going? And yes, I realize my contemplative grocery walk is a manifestation of my own privilege. Getting a half hour alone in a grocery store is not a universal right. Reduce, reuse, recycle doesn't make me a good person. Climate science scientist Catherine Hayhoe calls out folks who fetishize their 10 green commandments. She points out that focusing on personal action as the primary pathway to climate solutions enhances rather than diminishes the inequality of lifestyles that's being exacerbated by climate change. So that keeps me humble. <laughs> and it keeps me writing letters to legislators and working for systemic change. So that, as Heho says, the easiest, most affordable option is the sustainable one. But I will continue my meditative walk in the grocery store and tracking down where I can recycle my styrofoam and dropping off my soft plastics at Target or Sprouts and taking things to the thrift store for their next life and pre-cycling, choosing what not to buy. Let me close with a Depression-era saying I learned from my wonderful mother-in-law, Nancy Merrill, who understood the importance of how we interact with our material objects. Use it up, wear it out, make it do, or do without. Thank you. Thank you, Kitty. Please join me in our closing hymn, When Our Heart is in a Holy Place. Rise in body or spirit. When our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place, we are blessed with love and amazing grace. When our heart is in a holy place, we trust the wisdom in each of us, every color, every creed and kind, and we see our faces in each other's eyes, then our heart is in a holy place. When our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place, we are blessed with love and amazing grace. When our heart is in a holy place, we tell our story from deep inside, and we listen with a loving mind, and we hear our voices in each other's words, then our heart is in a holy place. When our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place, we are blessed with love and amazing grace. When our heart is in a holy place, we share the silence of sacred space and the God of our heart stirs within and we feel the power of each other's faith then our heart is in a holy place when our heart is in a holy place when our heart is in a holy place we are blessed with love and amazing grace when our heart is in a holy While I'm scrolling, I'm going to thank all of our wonderful presenters. You guys are just amazing. Thank you all. Oops. 
spiritual practices tend to have an ebb and flow throughout our lives. Something that serves us well at one time in our lives may not serve us in another. That has certainly been true for me. Yet, my favorite practices tend to start at the break of day, a quiet time when there's new beginning and new hope. When I was younger, I would run before work. I would head out to the hills of Glendale, sometimes before dawn. My mind would clear, and I would revel in the miracle of the day. I didn't have the vocabulary then to call it a spiritual practice. I called it my positive addiction. But it lifted my spirit on a regular basis and connected me to the great expanse. But then I had children, and my life was upended by new and exhausting miraculous activities. We joined this church, and on Sundays we were here, and that spiritual practice changed my life. There was a time when my kids were in school, and I would wake up at 4 o'clock a.m. to read from daily meditations and then write a response. I loved the peacefulness of that time before the hustle and the bustle of the morning. There were morning pages when I was doing Artist's Way, and so many other things that lifted my spirit and grounded me. Now, my favorite everyday spiritual practice involves my living room window. Again, often before dawn, I fix myself a cup of coffee, thankful for all of the toil and the hands that this coffee has gone through to warm my morning. Then, I sit with my cat purring at my side, and I wait for the day to appear. Some mornings come in blazing with fiery colors. Some mornings almost forget to appear, so socked in with fog, which slowly dissipates to reveal a quiet world. Some mornings have bright blue sky, some have wind which whips the trees around. Each new beginning is beautiful. And it reminds me that no matter what, no matter how crazy this world gets, our earth will keep on turning. And there will always be a new day, a new beginning, somewhere for someone. And sometimes that alone is enough. Please join me in reading aloud the words on the screen as we prepare to extinguish our chalices here and at home. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment, those we carry into our lives until we are together again. After the benediction and postlude, those of you joining us via Zoom are invited to stay for a virtual coffee hour as you chat in, a, in small breakout rooms. You here in the sanctuary are invited to join for coffee, tea, and conversation. It's outside the back doors today. Yes, excellent. I remind you that if you have a donation to make for our Lift Up Your Voice Family to Family Ministry, you may drop it in the basket as you leave today. I want to add my thanks to our wonderful presenters, but also to Celia, who put this service together. <laughs> go forth in love. Go forth in peace. Go forth and find your own spiritual practice. May it be so.